Today we're celebrating beauty and we're going to look now at the definition of beauty from dictionary.com. The quality present in a thing or person that gives intense pleasure or deep satisfaction to the mind, whether arising from sensory manifestations, as shape, color, sound, etc., a meaningful design or pattern, or something else, as a personality in which high spiritual qualities are manifest. And now we're going to see an, an additional um, definition, which is an outstanding example of its kind. For example, if someone says, wow, that horse is a beauty. So these are some definitions of beauty. J. Rory Corbett wrote an article called What is Beauty? And here is his definition. This is from the National Library of Medicine Journal. Beauty is not just a visual experience. It is a characteristic that provides a perceptual experience to the eye, the ear, the intellect, the aesthetic faculty, or the moral sense. It is the qualities that give pleasure, meaning, or satisfaction to the senses. And the bottom line really is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This next image is a photograph of Bob Marley. And that was the name of this camel. His name is Bob Marley. And he was a camel who we met in Morocco and he had the most beautiful eyes. Many of us just fell in love with Bob Marley, the camel. So it's, up to each person what we find to be beautiful. We'll have our next slide now from Mira. And she was the most renowned poet saint of India. Her songs are sung by Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. And she lived from 1498 to 1550. She wrote, I know a cure for sadness. Let your hands touch something that makes your eyes smile. I bet there are a hundred close, a hundred objects close by that can do that. Look at beauty's gift to us. Her power is so great, she enlivens the earth, the sky, and our soul. When our group was in Morocco, we focused on creating beauty in our experiences. This is a photograph that one of our participants uh, took during our journey. We looked at beauty in nature, in architecture, in the beautiful traditions in Morocco, such as Sufism. We found beauty in the people we met, the members we traveled with, in every moment we were surrounded by and enfolded in beauty. Now I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the kingdom of Morocco. This map shows where in the world Morocco is. It's on the Northwest coast of Africa. The population is about 36 million people. And as we'll see in the next slide, Algeria is to the east, Spain is to the north across the Strait of Gibraltar, and um, where the next slide shows exactly where the Strait of Gibraltar is, Africa and Europe are separated by only eight miles. It's this little area that uh, is the beginning of the Mediterranean Sea, and it separates the Atlantic Ocean there to the left of the arrow, and the Mediterranean Sea once you go through that tight passage there. Here we see a map of Morocco, and you can see the Atlas Mountains noted here. The Atlas Mountains are 1,553 miles across northwestern Africa. 
they go through Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and they separate the Atlantic and Mediterranean coastline from the Sahara Desert. The highest peak of the Atlas Mountains is 13,671 feet. And we were driving through the Atlas Mountains up, up to this peak. That's uh, 4,167 meters. This slide shows the route that we took. We began in Casablanca, which of course is famous because of the movie of that name. And today it's the financial center of Morocco. And then we traveled to Rabat. And then uh, Rabat is the capital city of Morocco. We went through Saleh there that you can see to Fez. And this is a beautiful medieval city. The, the Medina or Medina is the, is the word means the old city. And in Fez, the Medina is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And one of the things that really drew us to go to Morocco is the city of Fez. Because in the first Rosicrucian Manifesto, there is a character named Brother C.R. And he later becomes known as Christian Rosenkreutz. And he traveled to different places. And when he was in Fez, he went to this very important university that is the, is the longest continually operating university in the world. And it was founded in 1879. Fez was an important philosophical and intellectual center with magnificent libraries. It was also known for its alchemy schools. And it was here that Brother C.R. perfected his knowledge of historical cycles. And he learned through nature that what is below is like that which is above. In Fez, CR, Christian Rosenkreuz, was introduced to the elementary inhabitants. And these are gnomes and fairies and nymphs, and they revealed their secrets to him. Now, the elemental inhabitants, these are nature spirits. These are the essence of water, fire, earth, and air. And they're the invisible spiritual counterparts of the visible parts of nature that we can see. According to Paracelsus, the elements, the elemental inhabitants, share the secrets of nature with those who know how to contact them. And our brother CR was most impressed in Fez with the transdisciplinary collaboration among scholars of Arabia and Africa. They met in Fez every year at this university to share their knowledge. And if they found an idea that was better than what they believed and accepted before, they celebrated it and showed the, the, how their reasoning may not have been correct in the past. So we discussed this during our journey, imagine, the progress that can be made when people don't protect what they believe they already know, but instead celebrate when they're able to learn something that they believed may be wrong. And so instead they find the truth. And every year their knowledge in mathematics, physics, and magic was amended. So on this map, you can, you can see Fez. And it's, um, I learned that it's spelled F-E-S, not F-E-Z, like we typically spell the name in English. And then we went up north to a town called Volubilis, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was once the Mauritanian capital, founded in the third century before our era. And it became an important outpost of the Roman Empire. There are Roman ruins there that are really important in understanding what the Romans were doing in this area at that time. 
Then we went back to Fez and then we went south there past the Atlas Mountains to Merzuga in the Sahara Desert. And as you may know, the Sahara Desert is the largest hot weather, the, hard, the largest hot desert in the world. And the word Sahara actually means desert. Then from Merzuga, and we, we spent the night out in, um, uh, we were in tents out in the desert, which was quite thrilling. Then we went to Marrakesh, where there was another UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the main square in Marrakesh has street musicians and snake charmers and fire eaters. It's a uh, quite a bustling, fascinating place. And this Marrakesh was founded in the 1300s and it has just exquisite gardens and beautiful architecture and an important Islamic college there. And then we went uh, west to the coast. Our last day that we were in Morocco, we went to the beach town of Wusira just to, um, see the Atlantic coast there and to have a day of relaxation before we all headed back home. So we'll end our slideshow for now. We're gonna come back to that later. And the, in Morocco, there, is, there are original peoples there who we call Berbers. But that is not a complimentary name for this, this culture. They call themselves the Amazigh, like that. And their myths, legends, and history span 9,000 years back to Proto-Mediterraneans. And they're among the original peoples of North Africa. Through contact with other peoples of the Mediterranean, they created kingdoms as well as vast territories. They, they controlled huge territories and they organized into powerful democratic tribal communities. They were um, also very warlike and the Berber empires developed inland and when Islam uh, entered Morocco, they were Muslim. The term Berber is a variation of the Greek word barbarian used by the Romans. But again, they call themselves the Amazigh. There was a great Roman influence in Morocco and Morocco was annexed by the Romans in the year 40 of our era. And Roman rule continued until the year 429, when it was overrun by Vandals and Visigoths and Byzantine Greeks, one after the other. Christians and Jews arrived in Morocco in the second century. And in the fifth century, parts of Morocco were ruled by a great Jewish kingdom. Then Arabs conquered the region in the seventh century converting most of the non-Jewish inhabitants to Islam. But Judaism was still very strong in Morocco at that time. Fez became the capital of Morocco in 759. And again, it was a major center of learning for the entire Arab world. From the 12th to the 14th centuries, Fez became the largest city in the world. Fez was the largest city in the world, and its university, founded in 859, grew to be one of the greatest centers of learning in the Western world. And this is the university and the library that was referred to in the Rosicrucian Manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis. In the late 17th century, the Sultan Malwe Ismail commanded his officials to enslave all Black Moroccans. And they would buy coercively or freely those who were already, excuse me, those who were already enslaved. And they enslaved Black Moroccans who were free. 
including the Haratin, which means freed ex-slaves or free blacks. So the Sultan commanded his officials to enslave all black people. And this command violated the most important Islamic legal code regarding the institution of slavery, which states that it is illegal to enslave fellow Muslims. Um, Chok El Hamel, professor of history at Arizona State University, has um, presented on this, this, um, this period of history in Morocco. In 1912, Morocco became a French protectorate under the Treaty of Fez, and it was administered by a French resident general. So a few years before that, there was a meeting of European countries to decide who would rule Morocco. The Moroccan people were given no influence in this meeting, and it was decided that it would become a French protectorate and Spain would continue to operate its coastal protectorate. And the Sultan then had, was, was mostly a figurehead after that. Then in 1956, the kingdom of Morocco became an independent kingdom. Today, the king of Morocco is Mohammed VI, and he is the 23rd king of the Eliwite dynasty, which started in the 1600s. Today, more than 99% of the population is Muslim. And there are fewer than 4,000 Jews remaining in Morocco today. By the late 1980s, there was a thriving Jewish community. Um, but uh, by the, uh, up until the 1980s, there was a thriving Jewish community. But after that, 240,000 Jews immigrated from Morocco. In the year 2011, after a decades-long battle by activists, the Amazigh or the Berbers, this language was, a, was um, officially recognized as an uh, was a, a recognized as an official language of Morocco, and Arabic is also an official language, and French is widely spoken. So that's a little bit about Morocco. And now we're going to explore some beauty of Morocco. We're going to look at some images that were, uh, some of these were taken by participants in our trip, especially by Deborah, Diana, Bob, Chris, Dorothy, and Tiago. And this is a photograph of those majestic, long and high Atlas Mountains. Next, we're going to see a cedar forest. There is a massive cedar forest in Morocco. And on our journey, we stopped and had a meditation in one of these forests. Cedar is very important because the wood lasts so long and it's highly protected in Morocco because of its value. Also in this area were Barbary apes or macaques of the Atlas Mountains. And these are wild animals. This is a photo that a participant took. We stopped at a place and we saw these, these Barbary macaques in the distance. And there was a man there who of course had a little stand and he was hoping people would come to a stand. So he had peanuts and the, the Barbary macaques knew that. So um, if someone handed these little fellows a peanut, they would, they would take them from their hand. And if you weren't fast enough, they would give a little tug on the pants leg saying, I know there are more peanuts up there. So they, they were still wild animals, but they did come because they knew there were going to be peanuts. Next, we see an image uh, taken by a participant of a sand dune in the Sahara Desert. 
And the next image shows the shadow from some of our participants. We took a sunrise camel ride to the top of one of these dunes, and it just felt like we it was time out of time. It it we were it was it was we started before the sun was up, and the camels make this very uh, particular sound, and you could hear the saddles making the noise as we rode up uh, on the camels to the top of the dune for sunrise. And then we'd look down and we'd see our shadow that was projected against the sand dune next to us. And the stars were unbelievable. One of our participants took this with her camera. This is what the stars look like when we don't have light pollution that was in our very camp. And uh, it just was just such a touching and beautiful experience to be out in the desert so far from the lights and being able to see so much more of the, the starry sky. Then we continued from that area to a canyon in the high Atlas Mountains. This is the Tudra Gorge and has a spring and a river that runs through it. And it's, it's absolutely that beautiful. So Morocco has the seashore and the desert and this gorge and forest and the coastline. And that's what we'll see next. This, is, um, this image is um, the coastal town that I mentioned. And it was warm on our journey, but when we were here in um, Syria, it was, there was just a beautiful breeze. A lot of Moroccans come here in, in the summer to escape the heat. So that's some of the beauty that we experienced in nature in Morocco. And next we're gonna look at some of the beauty in architecture. And this is the mosque of Hassan II, who was the father of the current King of Morocco. And so this is a relatively modern mosque that is built in Casablanca. And there are only two mosques in Casablanca that non-Muslims are invited to enter. And we were able to enter this spectacular building. And everywhere we went, we would see this detail of uh, carved stone or stucco or wood. This is just walking past the building that we didn't even enter. This is a, a, another beautiful building. Symmetry is very important in Islam and in Morocco. And these buildings were often built with very thick walls for protection and also uh, to help keep them cooler. For in Islam and in Morocco, symmetry equals beauty. I mentioned the university at in Fez, and it's now a mosque and a, a Quranic school. We were not allowed to enter this mosque. This is a photo of what is in the inside. And um, so this is the university that was referred to in the Fama Fraternitatis. So all of these buildings, we have the um, a, um, Medina is the old town and a Kasbah is a citadel. It was the home of a leader. Like there was this, this this complex that you see is hundreds of years old and it was a fortress, the home of the leader and then people around the leader who would protect the leader. So it was the home of the leader and they were built for the protection of the leader. And if this looks familiar, this is the Kasbah 8 Ben Hadou, which is another UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's been used in many films. There is a nearby film studio called um, 
Atlas Studio that um, serves as the setting for many films that, that were filmed. Uh, you, you'll look at it and say, oh, I recognize that. So Morocco has a thriving film industry. This is a town called Chefchouen, and it's known for its striking blue washed buildings. So this was the view from afar. And then the next image shows um, how this looks up close. Many people blue wash their buildings and it just looks like a, a magical kingdom. It's, it's so soothing to the eyes. As I mentioned, the word Medina literally means city, but today it means the old town. And in the old towns, they would have the mosque and many, th this is a mosque and a Quranic school. And as you're probably aware, in mosques, no images of sentient beings are used. So there are no portraits of people. There's never a portrait of Muhammad. There are no images of animals. And it's believed that living beings are created by the divine and any human attempt to replicate them is wrong. So we'll also often see geometric patterns. And these are believed to be, to mirror the infinite nature of the divine in several ways. For example, circles don't have a beginning or an end. So it's reflecting the infinite nature of the divine. And um, there would be repetitive complex geometric designs in Muslim art that give the impression that even the smallest element of pattern plays a distinctive role in that infinite repetition of the whole. There's a prophetic saying that states, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. And this has been the foundation of the development of art in the Muslim world. So these patterns, and we'll look at a couple of more here, they are not meant to copy nature, but to reflect what nature represents. And I was gazing upon this image I was just standing there looking at the wall and it began, to, other geometric images were created in my perception. So I was just, I was waiting for the rest of our group. I was just, I had my eyes gently gazing on these patterns and then suddenly squares around these popped out. So I hadn't seen them before, but as my perception relaxed, other patterns were revealed. Sometimes they would move or change shapes when I would look at them. And we have another one here. This is a close up of that. So it looked just like what, what we see here. And then it would move in my perception and it would create circles or squares around the patterns. And the next image shows, this is a mosaic that was on the wall and you might even be able to see it if you gently gaze on this, you might be able to see it change whether it's a diamond or whether it's a flat top wide square, it'll, it'll move in your eyes. You know, in your in your perception, actually, and <clears throat> I've looked online to see like if that was the intention of this imagery, and I have not seen anywhere that it's the intention. I most definitely experienced it. Other people have written online that they've experienced it too, and um, it really was it was so interesting to to you real. I realized the thought that was put into the images that were created. And we have a couple of more images. This is, um, this is a Quranic school. And 
young boys are sent to Quranic schools to become imams so that they can serve in a mosque. It's always men who serve in the mosque as an imam and they recite the Quran. So they memorize the Quran, they become familiar with how they can teach others about it. And the boys, they, the, the, we were informed that the boys stay however long they need to stay. They need to mature, they need to learn the Quran by heart. So it's not like they go to school for a year or for five years, it depends on the boy. And then they go back to their home community. So they've made friends from other communities. And it was explained to us that by going back to their home community, this helps if their community has a dispute with a neighboring community, they've established this friendship from their time in the Quranic school. So it helps to resolve issues that may come up because they have a colleague, they have a fellow classmate in a nearby community. And this is, uh, I think we have one or two more images that um, maybe that's the last one. So now we're going to look at some of the beauty of the traditions in Morocco. Oh yeah, here, this is the, uh, maybe we may have one more after that. No, okay, so next, you can leave that there, thanks. Um, we're gonna look at the esoteric tradition of Islam, Sufism. While our group was in Marrakesh, we were greeted by the leader of the Sufi tradition in Morocco. And it was a great opportunity to learn more about Sufism and to connect with uh, a fellow mystic. And I'm gonna share just a few sayings by Sufis. None of them happen to be from, from Morocco, uh, but these are some of my favorite Sufi sayings. And the first one is by uh, Rabia Basri, who lived from 717 to 801. And she lived in Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq. And she became separated from her parents when she was young. And while she was wandering homeless, she was literally stolen and sold into slavery. And because of her remarkable beauty, a famous brothel bought her for a large sum of money. And um, today she is the most popular and influential of female Islamic saints. And she is a central figure in the Sufi tradition. So here is some of the beauty of the Sufi tradition. When the divine said, my hands are yours, I saw that I could heal any creature in this world. I saw that the divine beauty in each heart is the root of all time and space. Rabia greatly influenced Rumi. The next saying is by Rumi. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Rumi lived 500 years after, uh, after Rabia. He lived from 1207 to 1273, and he's considered one of the greatest poets known to history. He was born in Afghanistan, and when he was eight years old, his family was forced to flee from the invasion of the Mongol armies of Genghis Khan. And they settled in Konya, Turkey, and Rumi remained there the rest of his life. Rumi's teacher was a man named Shams Tabrizi, who was a wandering dervish. And Shams was on a quest for one spiritual companion 
to whom he could bequest his spiritual legacy. And that was Rumi. And Shams wrote, instead of resisting change, surrender. Let life be with you, not against you. If you think my life will be upside down, don't worry. How do you know down is not better than upside? These quotations are from one of my absolute favorite books called Love Poems from God by Daniel Ladinsky. And we've got two more here from the Sufi tradition. This one is from Hafiz, who is the most beloved of all Persian poets and was a Sufi. He lived from 1320 to 1389. He wrote, for a day, just for one day, talk about that which disturbs no one and bring some peace into your beautiful eyes. The last Sufi saying that we're going to read now is by Hazrat Inayat Khan, who was an Indian professor of musicology. He was a singer, a poet, a philosopher, and a pioneer of the transmission of Sufism to the West. He lived from 1882 to 1927. And he wrote, to treat every human being as a shrine of the divine is to fulfill all religion. So in this tradition of Sufism, the esoteric tradition of Islam, Um, we learn that Sufism is not so much a doctrine or belief system than it is an experience and a way of life. It's a tradition of experiencing enlightenment that carries the essential truth forward through time. And a Sufi website that at, um, the primary Sufi website states, if Sufism recognizes one central truth, it is the unity of being that we are not separate from the divine. And this certainly resonates with the Rosicrucian teachings. I'm reminded of the saying, the goal of life is to serve as a mirror in which the divine untiringly contemplates its own reflection this from the Rosicrucian monographs. This website continues, if Sufism has a central method, it is the development of presence and love. Only presence can awaken us from our enslavement to the world and our own psychological processes. And only love, cosmic love, can comprehend the divine. And again, this resonates with the Rosicrucian teachings. We have meditation techniques and other techniques that help to bring our awareness to the present moment. We focus on our breath. We attune with the essence within us, with the Rosicrucian overall exercise, with um, uh, attuning with the psychic centers. So, I think many in our group found the Sufi tradition that we experienced in Morocco resonates very much with the Rosicrucian teachings. So we can celebrate beauty every day. We don't have to go to Morocco to celebrate beauty. It's always around us. It's everywhere in every moment. And I invite you now to consider how you define beauty. And we're going to open the chat and just enter some, some ways that you define beauty.
Life is beauty, softness, experience, nature, that which fosters awareness, harmony, peace, connected with harmony, kindness. Oh, it's moving fast now. Wonder, purpose, namaste, soul connection. The ocean is beauty, a relaxing walk, grace, all in all, there is beauty and order, prosperity, that which inspires. We're all beautiful. We are all beautiful, aren't we? So thank you all so much for sharing in the chat. I'm going to ask another question. How does beauty touch you? How does beauty touch you? How does beauty touch you? Music, nature, sound, from the inside, joy, gratitude. When a person has a breakthrough, it stirs the heart, it calms. Oh, this is so beautiful. Smile, children's love. So next, what beauty exists around you at this moment? And if you're not entering in the chat, also think what beauty exists around you at this moment? What beauty exists around you at this moment? My family, all of you, the sun, flowers and trees, my dog, my rose garden, the trees outside my window, flowers and hummingbirds. This is going really fast, so I'm not reading everything in the chat. My son's soul is beautiful, trees in the sky, mystical symbols. All right, and then our last thing about beauty to consider, how can you expand your awareness of beauty? How can you expand your awareness of beauty? Appreciation, presence, slow down and smell the roses, another slowing down the way of the heart, meditation, slowing down attentiveness, looking closely, by being present, being open, to love it, to love beauty, yeah, meditating on love, creation. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. So, to conclude, I want to read again the quotation from Mira, the renowned poet saint of India and what she says about beauty. I know a cure for sadness. Let your hands touch something that makes your eyes smile. I bet there are a hundred objects close by that can do that. Look at beauty's gift to us. Look at beauty's gift to us. Her power is so great, she enlivens the earth, the sky, and our soul. So mote it be. Thank you all so much for sharing in this celebration of beauty. I wish, wish you much beauty in your life. I know it already exists, so perhaps I should wish you an expanded awareness of all the beauty that exists in your life everywhere, all the time. So mote it be.